Hi, I'm Connor Friedersdorf, a staff writer at The Atlantic Magazine. And I'm James Pullis of The Daily Caller and Ricochet and Vice. And we are going to start talking today about Super Tuesday, which is coming up, and the 2012 election. And I guess the big question is, is Mitt Romney going to be able to wrap this up on Super Tuesday, or are we going to keep going and going and going in the Republican primary and maybe even get to California, where James and I live? Uh, it could be the first time in my memory, and I don't know if, if it's true in my lifetime, but certainly the first time in my memory that California would matter in a Republican presidential primary. Uh, what do you think, James? I hope it gets to California. I mean, not only would it be sort of a good time for people like you and me who have never really enjoyed the full fruits of American democracy until maybe now, uh, but I think it would also show Americans and show Republicans who are outside the state and might not be fully acquainted with our crazy California GOP, uh, just really what's happening with the party out here. Um, and what's happening isn't very good. It's a fragmented and fractured party, and politics here is a rat's nest. Uh, and if we're going to go through this torturously long primary season where everyone can sort of take their shot swinging at the pinata of the GOP, uh, we might as well go whole hog and, uh, and, and drop the kimono and see the horribleness of uh, the California Republican Party in its full glory uh, so that we can then kind of scrape the, the shards back together and, and make a go of it against Barack Obama. Uh, do you think Mitt Romney would win California, or do you think someone else ha would have a chance? It, it doesn't you seem know, like I, Santorum country, but I, I don't know. No, it doesn't seem like Santorum country, uh, but then again, you know, I think six, seven, eight months ago, uh, lots of parts of the country didn't seem like Santorum country, right. and, uh, and, and look where we are today. Uh, it's a good question, you know, the, is California has recently changed their uh, delegate apportionment system. I won't bore everyone with the gory details, but I do think that if Mitt Romney is going to have some kind of uh, late-season meltdown, uh, California would be a great place for that to happen. Um, the, the party is basically split among... Uh, so Ron Paul libertarians on the one hand, uh, uh, rhino-y, moderate Republican types uh, on, on the second hand, and uh, now I'm going to have to go into third and fourth hands here, uh, uh, hardcore conservatives, uh, sort of uh, Tom McClintock conservatives, um, and then sort of country club conservatives who are maybe a little less hardcore than the, the grassroots types, but uh, don't have a whole lot of love for, for the, uh, the kinds of politicians who get uh, lambasted as rhinos. So that's a very complicated uh, political scene, and as far as who matches up, you know, Mitt Romney does post up pretty well, uh, but again, it, a lot depends on what happens on Super Tuesday, and if, uh, if there's a real push to make sort of a symbolic last-minute gesture of, of non-support or support for an anti-Romney. Uh, I think that you could see those kinds of hijinks actually play out in some kind of uh, a significant way in California. You know, one thing we saw after the 2008 campaign, after after McCain's victory, was that the party tried to change around um, the schedule a little bit and, and basically tried to draw things out more. And uh, in, in a sense, it's worked. I mean, the Republican Party hasn't, I don't think, been particularly happy with this primary season for, for Mick because of the candidates and because the, the drawn-out primary seems to be uh, souring uh, voters, maybe, uh, on on some of the candidates. Uh, but at the same time, this is sort of what they intended. I, I wonder, uh, maybe you have a, a guess about this, but what are they going to do in the aftermath of the 2012 primary? What do you think, what, what, what lessons are there to be learned? What would you be looking at if you were the Republican Party about, like, how do we want our primary system to run in the future? I'd actually be looking at some pretty major shakeups. The party is going to come out of 2012 with basically one of two faces. It's going to be Mitt Romney as the public face and just kind of bracket all of the, the disagreement and the dissension in the ranks. Or two, it's going to come out with a, a bruised and bloodied face and it's going to be, you know, sort of take me as I am in all of my ugliness. Uh, Barack Obama is a disaster, so vote for us, um, despite the fact that, that we're kind of a mess too. Um, if if Mitt Romney is the nominee and if he loses, then I think you're going to see a push for radical change in the way the primary season is handled. Uh, if Mitt Romney is not the nominee, or if he is, and it's just sort of obvious that he hasn't scraped the party together into some kind of unity, uh, then I think you're also going to see some degree of pressure, maybe not as intense, but uh, there's already been talk that, that Iowa is not the right way to kick off primary season. Uh, there have been grumblings about the way that the primary, the early primaries, encourage sort of rank regionalism, where you have, uh, where you have sort of a, a rural candidate, and then you have a you know a 
New England candidate, and then you have someone who can appeal to Southern voters. You know, does that really wrap up the the uh, the campaign in a way that's that's going to focus people's energies, or is it going to dissipate them? Um, so that you have what it looks to be what we have now, which is a number of candidates who can't really cross the threshold that allows them to wrap this thing up fast. Again, that might change after Super Tuesday, but even up to this point, I think a lot of people have been frustrated with the way that the candidates haven't been able to, uh, to punch their way up to the top of the heap and stay there in a way that allows them to convincingly rack up a number of victories. Uh, and that wears off on the process. And the process that we've got, it just so happens with this slate of candidates, not very favorable looking for the GOP. One reason I'd love it to get to California is, is I want to see how the GOP candidates would pander to us, uh, because we've seen Newt Gingrich pander to Florida with his uh, with his space dreams, and we've seen Mitt Romney insist that the trees in Michigan are the right height. Uh, and, and I wonder how, how how do you pander to Californians now that you've sort of wounded our egos by implying that our trees are not, in fact, the ideal height? Uh, and I, I don't really know the answer. Um, Maybe a sort of a guacamole pander w would get you the Hispanic vote in Californians at the same time. Um, but in serious sense, I wonder, uh, I, I assume that there will be something that, that one of the candidates will say to try and appeal there, specifically there, to yeah. Californians. And I don't know what you think that would, that would be. I, you know, there are many hilarious answers that we could come up with if we tried, but I'm going to go with the deadly serious, yet slightly still hilarious, unfortunately sad answer, which is pander to the frisbee throwing community. Pander to Americans who like to have fun at their beaches. Because right now, too many Californians can't have a good time at their beaches, unless their idea of a good time is sitting around in lethargy getting a sunburn. That's not good enough for America, and it's not good enough for Californians. I, I agree with you there. Uh, so, so another big political story this week has been Rush Limbaugh and the ongoing uh, controversy about birth control and whether... It should be subsidized by employers, whether it should be subsidized by religious institutions, whether, um, I, I guess the bigger question of whether, I think the progressive vision is that every woman in America should get birth control without a copay through health insurance. And th there's a lot of stuff tangled up in here. Um, I, I wrote a piece basically uh, criticizing Rush Limbaugh, as I have on a number of occasions, of when after he called a uh, this third-year college student our third-year graduate student, law student at Georgetown, a slut and a prostitute. And, and of course, uh, whatever you think about Rush Limbaugh, and most people think he did the wrong thing here, that doesn't mean anything as far as this larger debate goes. I personally don't think that institutions should be forced to, um, to, to subsidize birth control. Um, but I was thinking about why is this Rush Limbaugh comment uh, seemingly a bigger deal why is there? Why has he lost? I think twelve advertisers now, uh, in, including some pretty big corporations. And I, I have a guess, and I know you have a guess too. And, and I'm going to tell you mine, which is that I think that he took on a, a bigger class of people here. He insulted a bigger class of people than he ever has before. Um, you know, women who use birth control, uh, pretty significant number of people. Uh, people who have wives or daughters who use birth control, pretty significant number of people. And, you know, even in the, uh, even in the moment when he, was, when he was calling her a slut and a prostitute, I, I don't think he was actually saying that, uh, that all women who use birth control are, are sluts and prostitutes. At, at the same time, it sure seemed like he was saying something disparaging about, uh, you know, about women who use birth control, whether or not he literally was. And th there was one company, I forget the name of it, Carbonite Lux maybe? Or, anyway, one yeah, of the companies... Right, Carbonite. One of the companies that, that distanced themselves from, from Limbaugh in the aftermath of this, um, the CEO of the company put out a statement that explicitly said, look, I have a daughter, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so, uh, so so that's sort of my take on at least one of the reasons, and I think there are others, and, and, and you had a, a theory as well that I don't think is necessarily inconsistent with mine, but, but is different. Well, that's right. It's, it's not inconsistent with what you've said. There are a few uh, contributing circumstances here. One is, I think, you know, corporations of today aren't really a lot like corporations of uh, even 10 years ago in certain respects, and one of them is the way that uh, human resources departments have uh, have really shaped corporate culture and, and shaped it in a way that's, that's much more antagonistic to the kinds of things that Rush said in that segment. Uh, but I think that, you know, the, the key factor here 
And I guess I'm going to answer this question in two ways. Uh, one, what impressed me was that everyone made a huge deal about the slut term um, and almost no deal about the prostitute term. Uh, when in fact, Rush's argument, and he said this, you know, as soon as the, the word prostitute escaped his lips, first he said slut, then he said prostitute, almost as if he was cr trying to be more precise. Um, and then he said, you know, prostitute because she wants to be paid to have sex. So that's the charge. That's a different charge than the slut charge. And I think the reason why the slut charge has fared so poorly is because it's just a poorer fit with, with one, the case, and then two, the, the actual critique that Rush was trying to make didn't make very well. Um, had he not said slut and just said, this girl is like a prostitute, this woman is like a prostitute because she wants to be paid to have sex, I think this would have played out a lot differently. Still would have had the outrage, um, but, but the whole tenor of the conversation would have been different. And I think, you know, when, when you look at the way that the, the Democrats have very effectively and very deliberately um, politicked this issue, um, and it, it could be derogatory to say play politics with it, maybe not, it's, that's sort of the point of politicians, right, to win at playing politics. They play politics very well with this issue, Barack Obama calling Sandra Fluke and, and saying your parents should be proud of you, the whole thing. Well orchestrated, um, you know, call it astroturfed or not, um, there's some genuine organic outrage out there. Uh, there's also a vested interest, especially right now in Democrats finding uh, election year issues that they can really use to beat up the right with. Uh, with the passing of Andrew Breitbart, with uh, Rush Limbaugh potentially on the ropes here, losing some advertisers, having himself to apologize, even when you've got, you know, Rick Santorum saying, gosh, you chose the wrong word there, guy. Um, that's a weak point for Rush Limbaugh. That is a powerful moment for Democrats. Um, and so I don't think we should uh, discount the way in which they've, they've gleefully seized upon this issue as one that they, can, that they think they can really get just some traction out of. Right. I think it's, it's definitely true that the, uh, that the progressives trying to advance uh, this cause, their, their idea of, of what contraception politics should be in America, and the sort of Rick Santorums and maybe also the Rush Limbaugh's of the world, not, not to say that the two of those are the same, um, but they're sort of perfect foils for one another. And I, th I think that, um, you know, I don't think that anyone on the right at the national level has done a very good job of, uh, of talking about this issue. I mean, certainly I don't think slut was the right word. I don't think prostitute makes sense either. And, and I think Rush Limbaugh seemed also in his comments to be under the misimpression that birth control works like Viagra. Like, like he seemed to think that you pay per time you have sex for it. As well, and Connor, let, let me just let me just jump in for a second to sort of yeah. cross the T on the prostitute thing, uh, because yeah. even though the, the I, you know he wanted to say prostitute because she wants to be paid to have sex, um, right. that's actually much uh, what a prostitute does in the private sector is radically different from what uh, a person would do who says no the, the the public dollars need to go to subsidizing my my birth control or my contraception. Whether you're a guy or whether you're a girl, making that argument is making an argument much different than I should be paid to have sex by yeah, yeah. individuals. Yeah, uh, agreed. Yeah, I, I, that, and I, yeah, I thought that you were saying that before, and I think you were. Um, but but yeah, so I guess the, an argument that I don't see out there, and and that is the way that I feel about this issue, is you know I'm I'm not antagonistic to the idea of contraception in the way that some social conservatives are. In fact, I want it to be, uh, you know, broadly available, and I think that I would expand access in certain ways. Uh, you know, for example, I think that you, you should be able to buy it over the counter instead of having to get a doctor's prescription. Um, despite wanting it to be widely available, I'm against uh, subsidizing it in the sense that, you know, whether you subsidize it through direct government uh, subsidy or whether you force everyone to be part of a risk pool and then you, you dole it out through insurance, um, I think that there's a case to be made that it's good public policy to subsidize it for the very for poor, for people who wouldn't afford it anyway. But where I really want to put a stake in the ground is we should not be subsidizing it for uh, for people who can't afford it, for the middle and upper classes, even for students at uh, elite colleges who are going to have uh, you know a very high income potential uh, over their lifetime. And the reason that I think that is that it seems to me, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about, like, what is birth control analogous to? Is it analogous to uh, preventative care? And, and I think that 
in a way it's analogous. It, it, it is something that you're doing to prevent yourself from having a medical condition that you don't want. But, but it's also unlike preventative care in certain ways, right? Because that condition isn't uh, a disease, and also because there's another way to prevent yourself from from uh, from coming down with that condition, which is to to not have sex or to uh, even to have sex using condoms and their costs and their benefits of these different w ways of going about things. Uh, but, but I would I was trying to search for like an analogous thing, and I don't think there is anything else analogous in the healthcare world. But but an analogy that I've sort of come up with, that's maybe a little bit silly, but I think gets at uh, gets at this issue in in a way that is useful is what if there were a pill that came out on the market, uh, a new pharmaceutical, and what it did was it, uh, you, you could take it, and if you took it, you could drink alcohol without having any sort of health consequences, right? Uh, you, you wouldn't have any liver damage, you, you wouldn't gain any weight, and, uh, and what if this pill only were, only, what if it only worked for men? Actually, what if it only worked for straight men, since, uh, you know, gay people would be one of the losers in this birth control subsidy if they were forced to sort of pay into the system that, that funded birth control. And of course, they're not going to use it. And I think what, what this gets at is uh, it, it, the, the drink alcohol without any health uh, consequences pill, right? It, it would be preventative care in a way, but it would also be sort of subsidizing a particular kind of pleasure that only some people are going after, right? Uh, in the same way that only some people drink and enjoy alcohol, uh, only some people uh, enjoy uh, non-procreative sex. That is to say, you know, there are gays and lesbians that, that aren't after this sort of pleasure or meaningful experience, and there are people who are past childbearing age, uh, and they're, you know, so creating this risk pool is basically redistributing money from one to another. And I don't want the government to step in and say, uh, this kind of pleasure is a kind of pleasure that I'm going to subsidize and for sort of cultural minorities because, you know, most people uh, enjoy uh, recreational sex, as, as they're calling it, uh, at, at some time in their life, but, but not everyone. And I want the government to sort of be an even player and not subsidize this one sort of pleasure. Uh, so, so that's my sort of extended case against this subsidy. Uh, I think that's a good case. I think it's the right case. And I think... Uh if, if people want to make the argument that they have what amounts to a right to not just birth control, but affordable birth control, and then affordable birth control of the kind that they prefer, uh, right. then I think that they're making an anti-liberty argument. Um, and it stops being about, hey, I, you know, I'm a reasonably adult person, you know, whether you're six or 16 or 18 or 30 or 38, whatever. Um, I'm capable of making my own choices about uh, how much sex I want to have and who I want to have it with. Uh, uh, so, so go for it. Knock yourself out, right? That's one argument. The other argument is um, is not I'm an independent adult, um, but I'm sort of claiming uh, almost a dependency um, and, and placing the onus on, uh, on, you know, not just people who might have a freedom of conscience problem, with the activity. You know, if we go with your, your alcohol example, you can imagine, say, Mormons saying, well, wait a minute, you know, we, we're not really comfortable subsidizing um, right. subsidizing alcohol consumption, especially if it's going to be in this particularly uh, non-risky way. Um, right. So even beyond the, the class of people who would have a, a freedom of conscience complaint, I think anyone who, uh, who is interested in maintaining a, a society in which uh, people are free um, to allocate their resources uh, more or less in the way they want to, rather than in, in the way that you know their neighbor or some stranger might want to have their resources allocated for their own benefit. Um, I, I think your argument is, is the one that needs to be made, and I think that if Republicans spent more time making that argument, they would find that it would be more successful. Yeah. And I will say, um, I think one complicating factor um, for anyone who buys into my argument is that there is this way in which the system is set up uh, so that it's very hard for people to afford birth control because of the government intervention. And by that, I mean that we've, you know, we've set up this healthcare system now where, first of all, um, you know, it, it helps you out a lot if you get insurance through your work and there's all kinds of subsidies built in there. And there are also all of these sort of subsidies going to uh, sort of giant buyers of birth control uh, so that, 
you know, it, it's very hard to know what the price of birth control is, uh, what you should be charged as an individual. And, and I guess I would just argue that, uh, you know, I would like to sort of dismantle a lot of that stuff. And I think that dismantling it in various complicated ways would bring the cost of certain prescription drugs and birth control among them down. Um, but I think that there, there is a decent counterpoint to be made by people who are saying, uh, well, until you do that, uh, it, it, it's sort of uh, problematic to have birth control be this incredibly costly thing because of half of the government system and then not have them make up for that by subsidizing it so that it all came out even, I don't know. Um, but I think that the larger point should be that that when we intervene in the healthcare market, uh, we are going to increasingly bring contentious values into this in, in a lot of different ways because we've gone from a system where healthcare was what, you're, what you would negotiate with your employer or what the market would bear to a system where healthcare is uh, what we decide it is, what we decide it should be, and we're making these decisions as a society and trying to, to sort of uh, have legislation about these very complicated, contentious things about what is good and what is necessary and what is healthy. and, and uh, so yeah, it, it, it's really thorny. Um, but maybe, well, yeah, maybe, I, you know, I've I've heard yeah. I've heard uh, criticism of, of Rick Santorum and, and people like Rick Santorum along the lines of you know uh, they're imposing their value judgments on you know on public health. Well, if you cede public health to the government, you will soon find, as as Ron Paul put it, there's always an excuse, um, and almost anything can be defined as public health. Right. Um, and when government is in the business of deciding what counts as public health and what doesn't, what is worthy of public expenditure for reasons of public health and what isn't, it's impossible not to make judgments, and those judgments will take on the character of value judgments. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. Um, now, there is uh, there is one good... Uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, there's a bright spot on the horizon, James, and it is a theory that you have that we can uh, we can revolutionize the way that we think about uh, public health and education, and we can do it in one fell swoop with one easy policy. And you've written a column about this, and uh, well, why don't you make your case? What, what is it that we should be thinking about differently that would change everything? Okay, so the column is uh, titled New Age Fitness is the Solution to Our Education Crisis, and that's Maybe a slight overstatement, but considering what our current education crisis is, um, if we decided to adopt, you know, not as a top-down policy, but as an unofficial or informal, sort of bottom-up cultural approach uh, to to education, this is something that I think could be a big hit and make a big transformative difference, even in just a generation or two's time. Uh, if you look at the way that things that were completely marginal even 10 or 15 years ago, things like yoga and veganism and even vegetarianism, organic food, these are things that were on the margins of, uh, of, of mainstream society in America. And now they're sitting almost right at the center, uh, and that's the direction that they're headed. Um, if you look at that kind of change and how it was able to make such a difference, uh, really without you know government pushing it or corporations pushing it, these are things that increasing numbers of Americans have just adopted, and they've found them to be useful. Um, <clears throat> I think a similar thing could happen with kind of holistic approaches to, uh, to spiritualism and bodily health. And when I talk about bodily health, I'm not just talking about, like, let's run around on the playground for, you know, an hour a day. That's great. That's better than sedentary lifestyles for kids uh, or sedentary lifestyles for anyone. But it really doesn't get to the heart of what I think of when I think of true physical health, which is something that's disciplined, something that includes stillness as well as motion, something that includes active rest, something that includes sort of the ability to be calm and be still for an extended period of time in a way that connects up with the way your brain works. And there's been research done on this that, that just mere physical activity helps the brain focus or combats depression. Uh, but there's also been research more recently that explicitly demonstrates that the parts of your brain that work together to do intricate thinking, complex thinking, those parts of the, of the brain grow more quickly and work better together in children when they are participating in some sort of regulatory, regular, regular, sorry, regular exercise regimen. No regulation necessary. Uh, if we all started taking an approach to child raising, uh, whether it's in the house, whether it's in the home, or whether it's uh, you know at, at school, if individuals got together and, and 
decided that this was a good direction for schooling to move into as well. Um, I think what you'd see are kids who, one, become more physically fit, uh, but two, also learn the benefits of controlling your body in, in a way that has real tangible implications for your intellectual performance, for your educational performance. Uh, it all connects up. There are a few organizations out there that are starting to move us down this road, or at least point the way. One of them is down in San Diego. I just found out about it recently. It's called the Optimum Health Institute. And what intrigues me about uh, the OHI is they've got this holistic approach to, to disciplined physical health, but they're coming at it from what's actually a religious uh, position. Um, the Optimum Health Institute is, uh, is considered sort of a, a, a physical, like a healing ministry um, from a church with, you know, with what will probably strike most Americans, whether they're uh, more religious or more secular, is a funny name. Uh, you know, they claim to be Bible-based, but they've got kind of this uh, more, more loosey-goosey, new age take on, uh, you know, on, on what the message of Jesus Christ is and that sort of thing. What matters from my viewpoint is that Americans right now, you know, we're busy people, we're stressed out, modern life is tough, it requires us to make a lot of choices all the time, time is always at a premium. Uh, many people used to go running to organize religion to sort of help them with the burdens of life, uh, and especially the modern life of an individual in a society like ours. Um, that's happening less often, and there are people out there like, you know, Ross Douth that's going to write a book called, I think, Bad Religion, about how these kind of quasi-heretical uh, sects of Christianity um, that are gaining favor nowadays as organized religion of, of the traditional sort falls down, um, how that's a bad development. And I'm sure he'll make some strong arguments, he usually does, uh, but from my point of view, um, this isn't necessarily a bad thing at all, and there are some important ways in which it could be a good thing. Um, that these sort of more new agey uh, interpretations of biblical creeds, if, if they stick to a few key principles, I think plug in really well to, uh, to holistic, disciplined uh, sort of, uh, uh, practices when it comes to physical health. And that can help um, sort of average Americans, but it can also especially help kids as they're trying to, to do better in school in atmospheres where, you know, there's oftentimes there's a lot of frustration, a lot of parents who are not satisfied with the results. Uh, there are innovations in uh, online learning that, you know, from the top down, from college education all the way to elementary education. Um, but online education isn't going to revolutionize the way that we treat our bodies and connect our bodies up to our minds, um, unless, of course, you know, there's some further technological advance that, uh, that we don't know about yet. Well, so I guess my first reaction uh, to, to hearing you sketch that out, it, 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 it squares with my intuitions that we're going to have to have some intervention uh, as we're moving to a, an electronic society where everyone has, you know, the ability to text and look at iPads and uh, video games and uh, all of this stuff all day. You can sort of be constantly stimulated in a way that's much more intense th than at, at, at any time before. And... So it makes sense to me that part of education is going to be giving kids the tools to sort of unplug and have uh, quiet time, reflection, meditation, whatever you want to call it. Something that, that, that might have once happened more naturally, uh, but, but that has to be done more deliberately now. And, and, uh, and thinking about that seems very important to me and seems like part of what you're talking about. Uh, but, but I'm a little bit hazy on what else you're talking about. So, I mean, imagine that there's a, you know, six or seven year old kid in elementary school. And right now what they do is they go to school and they have, you know, maybe uh, PE once a day or once every couple days and they run around and play some sport and do jumping jacks and whatever. And, uh, and maybe they have a we fit at home if their parents are particularly conscientious about this, or maybe, you know, they do karate or they go and play a team sport or something. Maybe they just sit and watch TV after school. Uh, that's true of a lot of kids too. But so what would change uh, or sort of like what, what specific things would, would you want to see that kid do? Uh, right. So I'm, I'm hesitant. I'm extremely hesitant to say something like this should be a national program that we implement in all of our schools, right? It's a little too creepy, a little too North Korea. We don't want to go down that road. Um, right, but right. But if, if you, we, you know, we already we already have sort of physical education in public schools that's that's already part of the curriculum. Uh, you know, one thing that I would suggest, just as a, a, a heuristic, if nothing else, is to say, uh -huh. look, instead of just having them, you know, uh, run laps 
or play basketball, you know, again, not to cast aspersions on track and field or any particular sport, right? <laughs> right. But to make the point that oftentimes kids can participate in those activities uh, as, as they're built into a, a, a PD curriculum um, without really, I think, making the connection between uh, sustained physical concentration and discipline and sustained mental and, uh, concentration and discipline. So, you know, just think up your favorite uh, yoga pose and imagine um, telling your classroom of kids, okay, guys, we're going to hold this pose for the next, like, minute and a half. And mm -hmm. suddenly that minute and a half is going to seem to them like about 10 hours, probably. Right. Um, yeah. This is good. This implicates a certain kind of understanding of what it means to do mental and physical concentration and discipline at the same time. Um, you know, and it doesn't have to be some grandiose project. It doesn't. You, you can sort of check the the religious component of, of things like oh, at the door when you do this. Uh, but I think if we start doing little thought experiments like that, we might discover that you know, hey, there's a way of educating kids um, in a in a more holistic way that isn't vague and abstract. It's very practical and common sense, um, and I think it's got some real appeal. Yeah, that, that's interesting that that you mentioned sort of sidelining the religious aspect too, because another thing that, that seems like it could be true is that, um, you know, when there was prayer in school in a lot of places, uh, part of that was about communities wanting to uh, have their religion practiced uh, in, in that part of life in, in schools. And, and, and of course, a lot of people uh, don't want that happen. Want, don't want that to happen, and for understandable reasons. But maybe something uh, something else was lost. Something secular was lost with the disappearance of prayers, and maybe it was uh, something as simple as a moment of reflection, which is part of what prayer is. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued, and would would uh, would be interested to to know more about this stuff. Um, yeah, and, and you know, I'd also quickly say that that part of the the attraction, and I think part of the endurance of, of church culture. Um, is lost on us now because we think a lot about sort of the, the psychological, the emotional aspect of it, the mind control aspect of it, if you want to be pejorative about it. Um, there is a physical aspect of it as, as well. I, I've talked to a, a religious friend who has some kids, and you know he likes to take them to church, not just so that they can sort of learn whatever there is to learn in church, um, but so that they can see their father sitting still. And in church, it's in the context of, of sitting still before a higher power. Um, but there is just the, the brute fact of modeling physical control um, right. that I think church civilization helped perpetuate, and I think there's no way around the fact that we've seen sort of physical control fall away as a social ideal or a social norm as, uh, as the, the strength of church civilization has fallen away. No, in some ways, yeah. that's fine. That unleashes certain creative energies, and, you know, I'm totally okay with that, and I oftentimes enjoy losing a certain amount of physical control, too. Uh, but that shouldn't distract us from the fact that there are some real goods here that are in danger of being lost, and that we can recapture them without sort of doing weird or oppressive things to each other or to ourselves. Huh. Uh, well, th th this is going to be a rough transition because you have also recently written a very different kind of column. Uh, this column is about Napoleon and his legacy in Europe. And what can Napoleon tell us uh, about about Europe today? Well, here, I'll, I'll do the best I can at a transition. Um, Frederick Nietzsche w spent a lot of time writing about Napoleon, tucking little insights into his, uh, his famous and not-so-famous works. Uh, one of the things he said, or, you know, on second thought, it might have been Emerson, Nietzsche borrowed from Emerson to, to a fair extent on some of these things. Uh, anyway, the remark was uh, Napoleon got fat uh, basically um, riding around Europe, um, eating you know a few shabby meals a day, sleeping on the ground in the freezing cold, ordering men around in battle. Um, hmm. Sort of bizarre, right? But the, I, I think the point is he thrived in that environment um, at, at a time when, when not many people did. Um, and I think now, you know, it's, it's even more the case that we look back on that era and say, gosh, life is so tough. Um, these people, you know, they were willing to march off into Russia and, and get frostbite and drown in freezing rivers and, and you know, get picked off by, uh, by Russian snipers hiding in the forest in the dead of winter. 
all for what, right? Because they were being led by this uh, this charismatic madman, this egomaniac who had these delusions of grandeur. Uh, you know, guys like uh, like Victor Davis Hanson, I think, is a good example of a uh, a popular uh, and respected American historian who has this uh, pejorative view of the kind of historical trap that Europe is in, which is. Uh, you know, either they descend into chaos and age-old ethnic hatreds consume them, or every once in a while some sort of crackpot visionary comes along and says, I will unite you all on, with my iron fist. Uh, so from, you know, his viewpoint, uh, Hitler, Napoleon, ah, you know, they're all, um, they, they, they can all be indicted on the same counts, basically. Uh, I, on the other hand, would actually draw a pretty bright line uh, between a guy like Napoleon and a guy like Adolf Hitler. Um, I think that right now an important question is how Europe is going to find a way to forge ahead um, other than just sort of trying to stop the bleeding economically and hope for the best. Um, I don't think that Brussels is capable of, uh, of inspiring Europe to move ahead in any kind of coherent way. Uh, and when you cast about for uh, some source of, of uh, political authority, in Europe that, uh, that can inspire Europeans to move toward the greater Euro unity that they do, for some reason, seem to want again and again, and they keep not finding the, the right way to bring it about. When you cast around for, for where those resources are going to be found, I think you're going to find them in France. Uh, you're not going to find them in Germany, where, yes, they know how to keep a balance sheet, but uh, the minute they try to, let's say, teach Greece the, their lesson, um, what you get is political cartoons of uh, Angela Merkel wearing a, a swastika armband that might be overreacting, but I think it speaks very strongly to the limits of German authority in Europe. Uh, it's not going to come from Italy, it's not going to come from Poland. You know, sorry, Poles are our old, um, our new Europe allies. Uh, it's not going to come from Britain. Britain is turning inward. They are they're running out of money. They're turning to France, of all places, to help them scrape by as a, as a, a, a mid-tier military power. Um, and when you think about those things, I think it's inevitable that you start thinking about Napoleon, because here is really the last example, I think, that we have um, of a figure who was able to inspire uh, and create a, a good deal of political unity in Europe. Yes, there were wars. Yes, he had opponents. Uh, yes, the conquest did take place. Um, but when we're looking at the problem of, you know, what's really wrong with Europe and where are we going to find the solution, I think the, the problem that we're going to identify is, is a lack of, of political authority. And when we're looking for a solution, I think we're going to find that, you know, Napoleon's legacy is enduring for a reason. Uh, there's a reason why the Napoleonic Code is still sort of hardwired into a lot of European countries. Uh, there's a reason why, um, you know, the French are indeed uh, moving forward with plans to build something called Napoleon Land. Uh, which is really? sort of like is going to be this grand amusement park uh, built around uh, Napoleon and his exploits. Uh, they're going to try to do it in a way that you know doesn't offend anyone. Um, there's a reason why uh, something called Napoleon Land is in the works, and uh, something called you know Hitler Land is not. <laughs> yeah, several reasons I would, I would think. I wonder if Napoleon Land will have height requirements on its roller coasters. Um, I think. I don't know. I'm, I'm not convinced that that. Uh, hmm. I, I'm willing to go along with your argument that if someone is going to lead Europe, then it's going to be France. Uh, I think that uh, I certainly can't come up with a better argument for who would do it. Uh, but, but why does anyone need to lead Europe? Uh, why why can't it uh, disaggregate in the same way that it, uh, it that it built itself up into union? Uh, is there really, um, I, I mean, I, I guess one, one problem I have with the sort of European declinists is that it, it, as, as terrible as things are economically in, in some European countries right now, uh, and, and Greece in particular, um, things aren't nearly so bad as they were in the days of, uh, World War One and in the days of World War Two, and, uh, you know, going back to the Franco-Prussian War and, centuries and centuries of wars. Um, it, it's been a sustained period of peace and it's been interrupted by some riots in certain countries that are imposing austerity measures, but, uh, you know, on the whole, maybe, maybe it's a, a step forward, if not as big a step as uh, some folks would want. Um, and it, it's interesting that as there has been this move to unify Europe, uh, one, one that I think is, is largely elite-driven, although uh, it, it does appeal to some Europeans too, there's also been 
these sort of continuous efforts to disaggregate, uh, even at the country level, you know, even in Spain, you still have uh, Basque people and Catalans uh, who, who don't necessarily want, who want more autonomy. Like you have these little ethnic regions within countries that, that want more autonomy. Um, I, I, so I, I don't know. I mean, I don't really have strong feelings about whether more or less unity is the answer. Um, lost James for a second, uh, but I'll just keep talking and hopefully get him back. So uh, w w what I'd like him to answer is why more autonomy? And I'm going to ask him that in just one second. James. Yes, we can fix Are that. Sorry, right? Yes. What? Okay, good. So, uh, <clears throat> so you were so saying yeah, that you you don't know if you have strong feelings about uh, more or less disunity. Yeah. So why? Uh, tell me a little bit more about what, why why are we assuming that that more unity is the answer? What what uh, what problem cannot be solved unless there is more unity? Uh, well, I'd respond in two ways. First, I'd say, uh, by way of preface, that we could, in Europe, see both more unity and more disaggregation at the same time. Uh, so, you know, nationalism is sort of getting it from both ends um, on this view. Uh, yes, you've got, I mean, look at look at uh, Belgium. They don't have a government. Um, they, they're they riven by sectional differences, and they're finding some way of, of hobbling along. Same thing in Italy, same thing in Spain. Um, so it's true that, that those micro-ethnic and micro-nationalist movements could gain steam even as this uh, persistent desire to find out some way to unify Europe uh, in an increasingly political way um, also gains steam. Um, so, you know, I don't think it's as much a question of, of what unity can do, uh, what, what problem it is that unity can solve, um, unless, you know, unless you want to phrase it as, as the problem is that Europeans want unity. Um, I, you know, I, I suppose it's a bit presumptuous for me, an American, to dare characterize the, you know, the secret longings of a continent of people. Uh, but look at the United States of America. Um, it's another continent full of people who are living in democratic times, and uh, and the longing for unity is strong, um, even in the face of all of the uh, intense. Disagreement, the culture wars, the you know the politics of division, uh, uh -huh. the very fact that we spend so much time criticizing the politics of division, uh, the very fact that we spend so much time speaking the rhetoric of unity, saying you know my policy is good because it will bring us together, my policy right. is good because uh, because now is the time that we need to come together, and this plan will enable us to do that. Uh, so much of our mental energy is organized around the idea that if we don't come together, all is lost. Uh, and it just so happens that we have the benefit of all being in, in, in one country right now. Uh, and mm -hmm. it didn't have to turn out that way, uh, but it definitely did. Um, and, you know, I could spend some time talking about how the, uh, the, the victory of the Union in the Civil War was due in part to the fact that a lot of people just really wanted there to be one United States of America. Um, mm -hmm. They wanted to fight for the Union. They wanted there to be a Union and for there to be one and for all of us to be living in it. Um, in Europe, uh, it's been a harder road. Um, it's, it's taken more than, much more than one war. Um, it's taken some of the worst wars in, in the history of, of humankind. Uh, and, you know, and we're still not seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, this, is, this is going to haunt Europe until they find some way of, of resolving the problem. Uh, collective memory is a very stubborn thing. And, um, and Europe's experience with nationalism has been, I think, a, a bitter disappointment, uh, and one that Europeans are going to continue to look for a way to get beyond, in the way that the EU promised to get beyond it, uh, without, um, you know, without without bankrupting themselves, uh, without um, without stripping away their particular identities and, and failing to replace them with something more concrete. And again, if you want to unify Europe and you're looking for uh, some concrete European identity, where are you going to find those resources? You're going to find them in, uh, in, in what France has by way of a, a political creed. Um, it's reminiscent of what we Americans have, right? We have our declaration, we have our constitution. Uh, these are powerful founding documents. 
um, that, uh, that manage to capture what we think it means to be an American in particular, but also capture what we think it means to be a human being in a lot of respects. Uh, France has more of that than other European countries, than I think any other European country. Uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that frightened a guy like Edmund Burke, who, who in his very particular Englishness, uh, said, no, these, you know, our, our little societies grow in this very organic way, and, uh, you know, we English people can just uh, sit under the oak tree and continue to be English without having to worry about things like a statement of political principles um, or a written constitution. Uh, that's not the way it's worked in continental Europe. Um, and the French have uh, liberty, equality, and fraternity. And uh, in that phrase right there, I think you get, um, you get a, a, a codified example of the way that French people still think about being French, but also still think about what it means to be a human being. Um, and when you have a political creed that works both in that particular way and in that universal way, I think that's something in, in democratic times that's tremendously powerful, uh, especially when there aren't many alternatives. Um, let's move on to uh, our last topic, which is the changing economy of restaurants. Uh, Alexis Madrigal, my colleague at The Atlantic, wrote a post on our tech channel recently, and it, it, it basically uh, traces the development of something I've, I've actually been expecting for a long time, but is finally rolling out to restaurants, and that is sort of touchscreen options to order, where it, it's the equivalent of having an iPad at your table, and you can go through and look at actual pictures of the food, and you can punch in your order, and there's no need for uh, someone to come to your table. and you know, like a lot of technological advances, this is obviously something that has uh, labor market impacts, uh, and usually we can be sympathetic to the people that are losing their jobs, uh, but also say uh, you know, that this is how advances work, and this is how we get richer over time, and to have these sort of advances, and so we need to bite the bullet each time it happens and trust that uh, the rest of the economy is going to grow. Um, and, you know, it, that, that's certainly my instinct. That's, I certainly don't think that, that anyone should stop this happening. Uh, but I do wonder if there is a cultural component to this. Uh, I, I wonder if waiters and, uh, and other people in the restaurant industry have a sort of special place in our culture. And, and by that, I mean uh, a couple different things. Um, one, this is something that a lot of people do while they're trying to make it at something else. Uh, w whether it is trying to make it in a band, trying to make it as an actor, fam most famously, um, trying to make it through school. Uh, th this is something that is flexible and that uh, you know pays a relatively high amount of money for, for labor that you don't need a degree to do. And uh, it's, also, uh, it's also an industry that attracts a, a fair number of people who uh, are, I guess, alternative in some way or another, or, or don't feel themselves as if they would fit into a corporation. Maybe it's because they have, you know, they want to have tattoos on their arms and facial hair, and the other industry that they would want to work in would prohibit those things or would make them, you know, take, take out their piercings. And I don't mean to suggest that this is what all waiters or bartenders are like, but, but there's certainly um, a subset of the industry uh, that uh, it, it appeals to them because of the flexibility. Uh, because of the more lax rules, because of the different culture that is uh, distinct in a lot of different ways from corporate culture. And, and so uh, are we losing something important if our, uh, if our waiters suddenly become touchscreens? I think we're absolutely losing something huge and something with, with profound ramifications that we won't even begin to understand until perhaps it's too late. Uh, you know, the hospitality industry, in bars and restaurants, uh, fast food, big chains, uh, mom-and-pop outfits, it's really an industry that looks like America. Uh, all too often, it can get stereotyped into, you know, everyone, everything's McDonald's or everything's, you know, some, uh, like, yum foods, some corporate conglomerate that, that no one even recognizes, and they secretly run all these chains and, and exploit their workers or make sure that they get some tiny amount of money that will just keep them coming back to the workplace. Uh, you know, s silly characters like that. And, you know, yeah, we all know how, how very large corporations can sometimes behave uh, in ways that we'd rather they didn't. 
Um, but I think the, the interesting thing here, um, one about the technology and two about the kinds of people it affects, uh, is that it really frustrates many of our uh, prevailing assumptions and, and much of the conventional wisdom about, you know, uh, about who an entrepreneur is, um, about who works for corporations. Uh, I live on the east side of Los Angeles. Uh, you're uh, around here. You, you know as well as I do that much of the entrepreneurial spirit here uh, is driven by hipsters. Um, or by people who, you know, to the untrained eye, would look a lot like hipsters. Um, and what do they do much time? Much of the time, they start bars, they start restaurants. That's how neighborhoods start to uh, start to change. That's how they become enterprise zones. Is uh, some someone comes in uh, who, you know, looks a little bit rough to the naked eye, perhaps. Um, you know, although many of their tattoos are, are oftentimes very beautiful, um, they come in and they start a dive bar or they start a restaurant that serves food that is more delicious than you might think if you drive by the restaurant. Um, and so there's that class of entrepreneurs that, you know, that I think we definitely want to see more of. We want to see more of them in, in areas that aren't doing so well economically. Uh, and we don't want to, uh, we don't want to see their, their opportunities choked off by a mindlessly reflexive embrace of technology. Um, technology can be great. Uh, technology can can augment and supplement good human experiences, uh, but we don't need to let it take away good human experiences uh, if we don't want to much of the time. Uh, so technological advancement might be inevitable, but the way that we choose to use it isn't. Uh, so there's that entrepreneurial side, but then in addition there's the corporate side. Um, I don't know about you, you probably feel the same way. I have some very good memories um, of eating chain fast food. Uh, you know, when you're sort of driving down Sunset at 2 in the morning, um, Del Taco is there for you. And, you know, not many other people or places are at that hour. Right. Um, you know what you want. You know that you can get it there. You know that it's going to meet your, your standard of, of taste and quality for that particular time. Uh, you know, I just flew back from New York uh, last week, uh, landed at LAX. The first thing I did was drive to In-N-Out and yes. sit I, in I line for 20 sat in line for 25 minutes waiting to get that double-double. Um, was the food that good? Yes, it was. But what's my point? <laughs> my point is, who else was in that line? Well, like, all kinds of people were in that line. Like, every different kind of Angelina that you can imagine was in that line. Um, people right. who were just flying into town, people who were locals, people who, you know, every sort of ethnic background. Um, and when you look inside the internet, you know, what do you see? You see, like, a similar kind of diversity. Um, and you see people who, you know, there's no point in romanticizing, sort of making the best darn fries that you can make, but, you know, they're right. working in there. They're moving fast, and they're being paid pretty well. Uh, you know, I remember when I was in high school, uh, the, the best place to get a job was at in and out Burger. They would give you, like, yeah. 8 bucks or 10 bucks an hour. Um, that's the free market at work. Uh, you know, in and out might not be the perfect example of a corporate fast food chain. Uh, but again, you know, in the hospitality industry, what do you see? You see, um, you see America at work in a way that frustrates some of our lamer or less creative stereotypes about, uh, about corporations and about entrepreneurs. Um, and you know, when I look at the way that technology might upset that arrangement, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a little concerned. Um, and I'm especially concerned that, uh, one of the drivers for that kind of change is, you know, unfortunately, people who are well-intended, they want uh, lower and working class people to do better. They want to protect their jobs in, in uh, tough economic times. And the restaurant industry is definitely, you know, is, is at peril in that way because a lot of Americans will say, gosh, maybe we shouldn't splurge so much. Maybe we should just stay home. Uh, but raising minimum wages and indexing them to inflation, uh, there are trade-offs there that, that happen when you do that. And one of the trade-offs is you put businesses, uh, you know, uh, uh, hospitality industry businesses, in a position where they have to make some, some unpalatable choices about either raising prices or uh, increasing the burden on staff or making cuts. Um, and and yeah. the first people to get those cuts made, uh, the first people to be on the, on the losing end of those cuts, are the very workers that, you know, that people want to help when they're trying to just keep raising the minimum wage. Right. Yeah, it... it, it... Another, I guess, another cultural component of this that interests me is that, you know, I, I mean, I sort of want to see more, uh, more people with uh, tattoos and alternative haircuts and, uh, and you know, other sort of non-corporate looking things in corporations, on television, uh, in different places. Um, and, yeah, I, I guess I have a sort of, uh, uh, you know, perhaps a skewed... Uh, uh, perhaps skewed interactions with with like the uh, 
with, with the tattooed population of America because uh, what I see are like very skilled craft cocktail bartenders and very skilled baristas and people who, uh, you, you know, a lot of entrepreneurial people who I think, man, I would want to hire that woman or I would want to hire that guy if I ever started any sort of, uh, you know, just about any sort of business at all. And uh, I don't know. I, 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 I lament the increasing credentialism of our society, and I think that although uh, although a sort of clean-cut news anchor appearance isn't exactly credentialism, it is uh, it, it is a sort of cultural um, a cultural filter that I don't think is is usually justified. So uh, so I suppose if the if the restaurant industry does take a hit from new technology. Uh, I hope that the silver lining will be the spread of some of the, uh, the better parts of restaurant industry culture to the wider world, but I don't know. We'll see. Uh, yes, and tattoo culture as well. Uh, you know, this would be my uh, anti-snobbery campaign. It, it, it wouldn't be, uh, let's encourage people not to go to, uh, to, uh, to uh, community college or, or four-year college. It would, be, uh, it would be, let's not be snobs about you know, people with full sleeve tattoos. Um, because if you if you get to know them, you will see that about some things they're very conscientious, and um, some will, of my best uh, friends have full sleeve tattoos. I will I will agree to that. Um, so so on, on a pro full sleeve tattoo note, we close, and it was uh, it was fun, James. I hope we do it again, and good talking to you as always. Always a pleasure, Connor. Thanks. Bye bye.